Uh, it looks it's time to start my presentation. So, uh, my presentation is about the type checking for Ruby programs. So, okay. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Sotaro Matsumoto. So uh, my account is that one, and you can find me on Twitter or GitHub. So uh, I'm working as a CTO at a company, a startup company called Side CI. Uh, it is uh, located in Tokyo, and our product is a code review assistant. It analyzes your pull requests automatically and gives you some reviewing suggestions automatically. So uh, technically, this is a program analysis. So uh, I have been working for program analysis. It is to reason some properties of your programs without executing it. So it includes some flow analysis or some of the type checking. So uh, it was in 2005, I was a graduate student. So I started studying about the program analysis and then I published some papers about the type checking of Ruby programs. So I have, in fact, uh, about 10 years of career for this problem. So, <laughs> yeah. So let's start uh, about the, what is that type checking benefits. So as you know, it helps, it, it helps you to find more bugs without running your test, without writing your tests. So if you, your program contains some invalid method calls, that type checking will tell you. So if you, you pass an invalid argument to some method calls, type checking will tell you. So it helps you to finding more bugs in your program. So the, another aspect is it is a verifiable documentation. So when you are writing your libraries or you are writing your application code, you see a lot of libraries. Uh, I'm sorry, you see a lot of documentations. So the class documentations and method documentation. So you find which methods are available in that class or how can you, uh, how to pass the arguments to that method. So they are usually written in English or Japanese, so natural language. So you can read and understand what the methods are, but the computer doesn't. So with types as a verified documentation, that type checking tool can verify instead of you. Well, uh, it also helps some refactoring. So when you are working on some legacy code, so you try to refactor some, some of the code, maybe you change the method signatures or method names. So after changing your definition of that method, you have to update the, all of the coding locations on your programs. So you have to find out the, every method calls in your code. So you, instead of using some grep or running tests, the type checking tool will help you where you have to fix. Uh, another big benefit of type checking is the optimization, but uh, today it is out of scope of my talk. So, so uh, this is a really short uh, the summary of the type checking for Ruby. So uh, the humans have tried to type check Ruby programs for about 10 years. So uh, I list here for I list here uh, four type checking tools. So which is developed by uh, some 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 researchers, some students, including me. So it starts with the 27 or 29. I call it it is the first generation of the type checking tool for Ruby. So it was focusing to type the objects in Ruby. So 
I mean the duct typing. So the second generation is uh, number three and four listed here, and it is for supports uh, meta programming. So the, the difficulties for type checking Ruby program is uh, I list the three difficulties. The first one is type inference. As you know, Ruby is a dynamically typed language, so there is no type annotations included in your Ruby code. So to check the consistency of the types in your Ruby code, it first to infer the types, how the code, the expressions, the nodes on in your program it should be typed. So that type of inference is the first difficulty. The second one is that the, the semantics of the Ruby is object typing. So I call here the dynamically typed objects, or you, can, you know that it is a duct typing. So what is the, that the, the duct typing is? So it means that the class of the receiver does not matter when you call some methods. So uh, this is different from other popular, some of the popular statically typed languages like Java or C Sharp. So you are lobbyist, so you love the feature. So uh, let me explain using the example. So. The, the, the right code is to define the right method. So it receives one argument called IO and uh, using the left shift operator to then print some string. So uh, the, from the point of view of the types, so the, we can use any object if it supports the uh, left shift operator. So we can use the right method for I/O files, or you can try the string I/O objects. You can try the string, and uh, in fact, we can try with the array. So they are, they all have the left operator, and uh, we can use for that. So uh, to support that. Uh, that duct typing semantics. So uh, I, I'd like to introduce a paper. It is Static Type Inference for Ruby. It's published in 2009 by Professor Foster and maybe his students. So it is based on the structural subtyping and uh, it needs some annotations for polymorphic method. So I found uh, one week ago that the implementation is still available on GitHub, so we can try to build that, that tool uh, called the Diamond Back Ruby. So what is structural subtyping? It is uh, subtyping with the structural relation identification. So yeah, so let's, uh, let's see the example. So this is that the right method has the type it is shown in the left. So it takes one argument of an uh, object. Uh, it, has, it should have a left shift operator and it should take the string argument. The return type of the left shift operator is not used at all in the method. So it is uh, written using the variable A. So let's see how we can type check that method calls like this. So this is a first example. It pass a string. So it checks the type of the string, the uh, definition of the string class object. So it finds there is a left shift operator in that, that definition. So the typing is OK. How about string IO? It also has the left shift operator. It's OK too. It returns the string IO, but the return type of the left shift operator is not used at all in the right method, so it doesn't matter. But how about uh, we pass a 
true. It is a true class, so we cannot find any left shift operator in the definition of the true class. So this is a type error. How about integer? It has a left shift operator, but the argument is an integer. So we cannot use that integer to pass, uh, we cannot pass the integer object to the right method. So this is a very easy explanation of how structural subtyping is. So uh, the diamond back Ruby is based on the structural subtyping and it can infer some types of the, some of your Ruby programs. But there is a big limitation that it cannot infer the polymorphic method. So this is an example of the polymorphic uh, Ruby programs, like the, the ID method takes one argument and returns that argument uh, immediately. So the, 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 the first line is ID new of ID three will be number three. So we can calculate three plus three uh, will be uh, six. And the next one is uh, we pass a string. So the type of the ID of who is a string. So string concatenation also works. So there is no type error in this program. But uh, because the diamond ruby cannot infer the polymorphic method, so it saves some the type errors. So if we want to infer, want, uh, if we want to define a polymorphic type method, we have to write some annotations in our Ruby code. So uh, this is my paper, in fact. So it's type inference for Ruby programs based on polymorphic record types. It was published in 2007. And uh, the, my paper is to infer the polymorphic method types for Ruby programs. So it is based on uh, ML's type inference. ML is not machine learning, it is meta language, uh, a programming language. So we used, uh, uh, to, uh, we used an encoding of polymorphic record types to represent the type of Ruby object. So I, I believe it works, but there is also a big limitation that it cannot type some Ruby built-ins. So some Ruby built-ins includes uh, array hash map. So, so uh, our type system cannot give a type to array hash map. So, then uh, we have a conclusion like this. So, we can give a types to Ruby's object using structural subtyping or maybe polymorphic record types. So it is a good approximation of the semantics of Ruby's type. So the, 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 uh, okay, the subtyping relation is de defined by if that type has a method or not. So it is really good the, a uh, good fit for the Ruby semantics. So, but the, the problem is that type inference does not work well. So if we choose a structural subtyping, we cannot infer the polymorphic types. If we choose the ML-based type inference, we can, choose, we can infer the polymorphism, but we cannot type some of the Ruby's built-in. So the next question is, that uh, do we really need a uh, type inference for Ruby or not? So we can see that next idea of local type inference. So it is the weaker version of the type inference. So instead of inferring everything in the program, it only infers the local, uh, local, local, local elements, like the local variable types and the if we use a polymorphic method called it infers the types. So with local type inference, the program, programmers should write the method types or class types. So we need some annotations in the Ruby programs, but we don't have to write everything. So a good thing is it is 
easily integrated with existing languages like maybe C++. It's recently introduced a local type inference, and uh, we can think about the Scala or Swift. They also have the local type inference. So uh, this is an example that uh, this is a Ruby program with no type annotation. So to type check the, this Ruby program, uh, we need a complete type inference algorithm. So there's no type, uh, type annotations. It is untyped or we need a complete inference. So this is the opposite. It is the free type annotated. So we have to, uh, I'm sorry, the range, range ones are the type annotations. So, do, so uh, we have to annotate the method arguments, method return type, and we have to annotate for the local variable types. The size local variable is integer here, or something like that. We also have to annotate the types of the block parameters and the block return values. And uh, in fact, the map is a polymorphic method, so we have to explicitly give the type applications so it is string. So the middle is the local type inference. So we need to give the type annotations for the method parameters and method return types, but in this example, we don't have to declare any type annotations in the local variables or uh, to using the uh, blocks or maps. So the type of local variable size is inferred from its right-hand side. So array.size is integer. So the size, uh, I'm sorry, the type of size is integer. So something like that. So uh, we have something like some answer like this. So we should try that structural subtyping and local type inference. So we know that structural subtyping is uh, it's enough to support the Ruby semantics called stack typing, or uh, we can use the local type inference to minimize the number of keys you have to hit. So uh, this, this design is similar to TypeScript. It has a structure subtyping and it also infer uh, the types locally. So the type checking difficulties uh, now like this. So instead of having complete type inference, we can use the local type inference. We annotate some Ruby code using the, uh, the type annotations. So, but uh, we don't have to write any every types in your method definition. So we have the difficulties on dynamically typed object, but we now we can support that duck typing semantics using the structural subtyping. So that left that. Uh, the difficulties it is left to open is metaprogramming. So what is metaprogramming? You know that uh, it, it is a program that modifies a class or method definitions during its executions. So the popular metaprogramming primitives in Ruby include defining method or class.new. So if we write the, if we write without metaprogramming, we can write the, write the left-hand side. So it's defining a person class and defining a method called name. It returns uh, instance variables. So using the metaprogramming primitives, we can write on the left. So we use the class.new method uh, we use the class.new method instead of the class syntax. We use the define method method to define the method instead of the def syntax. And we can also use the instance variable get method instead of the writing the name of variables. 
So the meta programming is so popular, so abused in your Ruby code. <laughs> so it's not a special one. So you write attribute reader or attribute accessor, it's a meta programming. It's a method to define the accessor methods. So it's meta programming. How about active record? So it connects to your database and finds the current definitions. And finally, it defines some attributes by itself. So it's meta programming. Has many or belongs to also define the methods by itself. How about require? I think that everyone have used require. So we can do something like this. If some condition holds require, so it says if the, the random number, uh, probably about the 30% of the execution defines PP method, but the rest is without the required method, uh, required. So this is same to the open classness, something like this. So we can have a condition surrounding the class definition. So it's not clear that the class is defined or not. So uh, this is the difficulty of meta programming. So uh, it's done by some method calls, so it's really difficult to identify the structure of actual type structures, the structure of the types without executing that. So we have to infer that cases that if there is uh, the, the code snippet using the metaprogramming is uh, called before uh, this case or so. So uh, one idea is to support, to, to give a special support for attribute reader. So if we find uh, attribute reader in the class definition, we see that it is uh, to defining the method using, uh, we translate the ATTR reader method call to the dev syntax. Maybe we can do that, but what if that method is over, overridden? So, yes, so in that definition of person class, it looks like that it is to define the reader attribute, but in fact, there is an override in the object class, so it is ADTR accessor, so everything will go broken. So uh, this is the metaprogramming difficulties, and uh, I think there is two solutions for this. So the first one is we stop type checking in statically. So we can type check that during the execution instead of the check everything in before execution. So this is a really cool paper. It is published last year, just in time static type checking for dynamic language. It is by Professor Foster and uh, I, I, I don't know who is that, Len. That, uh, Professor Foster is the team, he develops that Diamond Back Ruby, so his team continues almost 10 years for the Ruby's type checking, so it's of something. So in this paper, it, it, uh, the interesting thing is it runs the static type checking during execution. Static type checking during execution, so it's a bit difficult to understand to me. So uh, the implementation is called Hummingbird and it's uh, built on top of RDL. So uh, you may know that it is a dynamic type checking, dynamic type annotating a library for Ruby. So uh, this is how the Hummingbird implementation type checks. So uh, this is an example that uh, it defines a F method. So if we 
execute that program in Ruby, it is no error will be detected, no error will happen. So uh, we pass the if method, uh, empty string and uh, false. So it goes to the if condition is the false, and then x dot foo will not be called. So then no type error will happen. But uh, with the just in time type checking, it's called hummingbird. So type error is detected. So it doesn't type check statically, but uh, the, during the execution of the program, when the execution reaches on the beginning of the method f, it type checks its body. So then the x dot foo if y is checked. So the usually the static type checking ignores the branching conditions. So it goes the when the if condition holds or not, so it checks the both case. So it tries to type, uh, type check the, 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 the else case, and uh, it type checks the x dot foo's method call, and it knows the string doesn't have a foo method, it's then it is a type error. The interesting thing is that the type checking is done during the execution. So if we have a method definition in the string class like this, so if there is a code snippet to define the full method of the string, so it will pass the type check by having bad. So uh, yes, so it, it has a good point that it detects more errors in unit test. So it's expected to use to be used to run the unit testing or integration testing. That anything you uh, you write the automated testing. So in the automated testing, you you your program calls the most of the methods you are defining. So then it type checks most of the cases of the your programs. So this is much better than writing the unit test for every branching coverage. So even if we have a low branching coverage, uh, it finds more errors. The, uh, however, it's, I, uh, in my opinion, I don't like this approach so because that, that type checking is depending on the runtime behavior. So if you, uh, your program requires some library, it is not called in the production, so that library, uh, I'm sorry, that you are, uh, you are some, some classes in your program may have another method. It is not available in production or such things. So I want to go to the next one. So to support the metaprogramming, we want to ask programmers to give the type structures. So instead of the type checking tool to infer the structure of types, the programmer gives how the type is. So this is, in fact, my type checker called Steve. I had a presentation in last Ruby Kai September. So uh, it is a gradual typing for Ruby. So it's available in GitHub or you can try the using Jam. So I'm sorry, it is really experimental still and uh, it's not released yet, so you have to give the pre option to install that. So a uh, key idea of the type checking tool is the type definition is written by another limited language. So it is not extracted from the Ruby code. So uh, this is an example. It defines a contact class. So it is a, it has an initialized method. It has a name keyword arguments and the type of the name is string. It also has a name properties. It returns string. So we write something like this. We specify the 
uh, that the, the signature of classes you are defining in your Ruby programs. Every classes you define in your program, you have to write the signatures. So this is uh, written in .rbi file in Steve, and the type definition language is really limited functionality. It's really limited expressiveness. So it is to give the precise type definition statically without execution. So there is no open class, no conditionals, no require, no meta programming. So we can read the type definition file and understand how that type is defined precisely. So let me explain how the type checking will be. So we have the contact class uh, type definition here, and uh, we have some Ruby code to define the contact class. So we give a type annotation like this, at, at implements contact, it tells that the class is uh, conforming to the class definition of a contact. So if we find the implements annotation, it checks that it defines, if the class defines all methods defined in the signatures. So it first checks the initialize method is defined or not, and it checks the name parameter have, uh, name parameter is defined in the initialize method or not. And finally, it also checks the name method is defined or not, or if the type of the name method is correctly, correctly defined or not. So uh, this is about the metaprogramming, so we can try to define the contact class using some metaprogramming called editor reader. So in this case, the name method is not defined, no def syntax for the name method. So the steep cannot understand if the name is defined or not. So to, it is the programmer's responsibility that to tell that uh, we, I define the name method using without the def syntax. So this is atomic dynamic syntax. So if you know uh, object, Objective C programming language, so it also has the atomic dynamic annotation. So because the stick doesn't doesn't know how the name method is defined, so you can use another meta programming technique like the method missing. So instead of ATTR reader, you can define any way you want. So uh, the difficulty is some Ruby programs cannot be typed statically using Steep. So this is a um, very simple example. It defines full method in class A. So in the definition of the full method, it defines full method again. So if you call the full method first, it returns number three, but it also defines new full method. So the next time you call the full, it returns a string instead of the integer. So unfortunately, the step cannot give the types, give a good type for this kind of program, but man, in my opinion, who cares, so. <laughs> probably, maybe you don't write a Ruby program like this, or maybe you don't want your teammates to write program something like this, so it's not a problem. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, so I <laughs> introduced the four type checkers it is developed for these 10 years. So, the first two is the first two type checkers are focusing on typing the dynamically typed objects, and it tries to infer the types. But uh, after the, some years of the some efforts, uh, we found that uh, we cannot infer the types to Ruby programs. So we have to write some annotations for in Ruby programs, or we can use the technique called the local type inference to to, to, to give that, to tell how the Ruby program is typed. 
And uh, it moves to the next stage that we focus on how meta programming can be supported. So uh, just in time, static type checking for dynamic language is a really awesome paper. It's really interesting, but uh, I don't I don't like that because it, it requires uh, program execution. So I tried to develop my own another type checker for Ruby. So it is steep. I, I uh, and uh, so I had a presentation in Ruby Kaigi. So I introduced uh, four type checkers, two historical type checkers about ten years ago, and uh, two relatively new type checkers. So, and there is no conclusion in this talk, so <laughs> the, the type checking for Ruby is still an open problem, so anyone on the earth doesn't have a good answer to, we can do that or not, how we can do that or not. It's impossible, so there is no answer yet, so, mm. <laughs> have to say, so, yeah, uh, we are working for this, so, yes, thank you.